the ordinary. So this morning, I want to talk about being a crazy fan. So do we have any sports fans in church this morning? If you're a sports fan, put up your hand. In church, you're allowed to put up your hand. So there's some of you who are sports fans. So we're going to just talk a little bit about being a sports fan. A fan is an enthusiastic follower. You know that there were many people that Jesus encountered that became enthusiastic followers. That they were enthusiastic about following Jesus. And that, that's what it means to be a crazy fan. You know that we were created with a desire to worship. And if I don't express that desire to worship, I'm going to find something to worship. That is why it's good for you and I to worship God, because He's the one who is worthy of our worship. He's the one who is worthy to be a crazy, enthusiastic follower of, because there's none like Him. Say amen. amen. To worship means to hold in high esteem. It means to value above yourself. It's to give honor to. So that's what it means. So when Jesus encountered people, he said often, he said to people, follow me. And they became enthusiastic followers because they would leave everything to follow him. People became crazy in their thinking. They would walk out into the wilderness to follow him with no lunch, with no water, and spend the whole day listening to him as enthusiastic followers, as fans of him. Two I want to just bring out is the Samaritan woman in John chapter 4. This is a woman who encountered Jesus at the well, and they have a conversation together, and Jesus says to her, listen, you're not uh, married to the one you're with, and you've been married four or five times before, and they have this dialogue, and she encounters Jesus as the water of life, and she goes in back to Samaria and brings out the whole village because she was an enthusiastic follower. She was a fan. In verse 39, it says, from that city, many of the Samaritans believed in him because of the word of the woman who testified. He told me all the things that I've done. So when the Samaritans came to Jesus, they were asking him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. Many more believed because of his word, and they were saying to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves and know that this one is indeed the Savior of the world. Because of her encounter, she went and was a bold witness in the town of Samaria, and many believed because of her one encounter. The other one I've just chosen is the man with the legion of demons. In Luke 8, 38, it says, But the man from whom the demons had gone out was begging him that he might accompany him. But he sent him away, saying, Return to your house and describe what great things God has done for you. So he went away, proclaiming throughout the whole city what great things Jesus had done for him. Proclaiming throughout the whole city the great things that God had done for him. So my challenge to you this morning is, are you an enthusiastic follower? Or in my terminology, are you a crazy fan? So, number one, a crazy fan is emotional. Do we have any Blue Bulls fans in the house this morning? We got one. We got two. We got three. We got four. Okay, so we've only got four, four Blue Bulls fans, but do you know that we call them fans? Hey, they're a Blue Bulls fan. And I like to rip off the Blue Bulls fans, even though you know that the Blue Bulls franchise is the most profitable franchise in all of Super Rugby. Because they got fans like this. <laughs> Guys who are willing to paint their faces blue wear helmets with horns, wear blue wigs, have funny things on their helmets, and they are not ashamed to be called Blue Bulls fans. And they're a strange bunch because they don't, they are not ashamed of being saying, I'm a Blue Bulls fan. Now, many of you are ashamed. Many of you would be ashamed to say, I'm a Blue Bulls fan. But if you're a Blue Bulls fan, there's no shame attached to it. It's like Akers Blow Biller. They're emotional guys. They, they, they do anything for their spawn. Now, every week we sing songs about who we're supporting, who we're a fan of. In 1 Timothy 6.12, it says, fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art called, and have professed a good profession before many witnesses. It's talking about a profession of your faith. 
It's talking about being an enthusiastic fan, somebody who's, listen, I don't care what anybody thinks because I know who I'm supporting. In the message, it says, but you, Timothy, man of God, in the, in the previous verses, he's talking about how riches have corrupted many people. But then he says, but you, Timothy, man of God, run for your life from all of this. Pursue a righteous life, a life of wonder, faith, love, steadiness, courtesy. Run hard and fast in the faith. Seize the eternal life, the life which you were called to. The life you so fervently embraced in the presence of so many witnesses. One thing we need to understand as enthusiastic fans is that, listen, we have to be bold about our proclamation about who we are a fan of. And secondly, to recognize that we are not fighting the good fight of faith so that we can attain victory one day. No, the Bible says that because we are in Christ, Jesus has already won the victory on our behalf. So I'm already a part of the winning team. You know, what's so amazing about a fan is their team will win and then everybody will say, we won. And you did nothing. You sat at home and you watched TV. But because your team won, and you're a fan of that team, you say, we won. Now that's so true of the gospel, because Jesus has won and has already attained the victory for you and I. I can live with a sense of victory in my heart. Because He won, and because in Him I live and move and have my being, I have victory because Christ has already attained the victory. He has already attained victory over death. So I no longer have to fear death. The great enemy, the Bible says, of death. I live with a sense of victory in my heart. Not, and does life throw curve boils? Curve boils, yeah, sometimes. But <laughs> curve balls. Yes, it does, but I still don't live with a victim mindset because if Jesus has overcome all things and has attained the victory on my behalf, if I'm in him, I live with that same victory in my heart. So I'm not trying to get victory. If, if I believe that I still need to attain victory, what I'm communicating to my heart is my self-effort is somehow going to get me there. And I'm not trusting in Jesus and what he's already done for me. That is why it's so important that I come back to that place if I'm encountering opposition in life to ask myself the question, did Jesus overcome this? The answer is yes. There is nothing that he did not overcome. And then the next question I ask myself is, am I in him? If I'm in him, then it's like, you know what? I already have victory. So I'm going to walk that victory out, reminding myself of who I am who I belong to, who lives inside of me. See, God has asked you and I to be a powerful expression of who he is. You are not just a mamby-pamby baby Christian trying to struggle through life. No, you have a champion living inside of you. You have the one who has attained all of heaven through his work, and he now lives inside of you. So who or what can come against you if the creator of the universe lives inside of you? That is why he's asked you and I to be a powerful expression of who he is. Because he comes and lives inside of you and he says, listen, I want you to display to the world who I am. And that's what it means to be an enthusiastic follower. Because he has won the victory for you. And he now comes and he asks you to participate in the spoils of what he's already accomplished. In Colossians 2.15, in the message, it says, He stripped all the spiritual tyrants in the universe of their sham authority at the cross and marched them naked through the streets. In the Amplified, it says, God disarmed principalities and powers that were ranged against us and made a bold display and public example of them in triumphing over them in Him and in at the cross. See, it, it's great that I'm a, I'm a sports fan. I love sports. My kids know Saturday is Dad's day. Saturday, I control the remote, and it's on channel 201 to 2010 only. There's no cartoon network, there's no children's Disney channel, nothing. And they come and they ask and they'll say, Dad, can we watch TV? I say, yes, with pleasure you can watch TV. You can join me from channel 201 to 2010. <laughs> if you want to watch other TV, find another house. 
Saturdays, we watch sport. I'm a fan. But you know what? I support rugby. 30 oaks chasing a pig skin with air in it. But you know there's something else that I know has eternal value. And as much as I'm a, I'm a fan of sport, I'm a fan of Jesus and the kingdom. You know, the take home with God is eternal life. The take home in sports is a trophy, which is temporal. But you and I have been asked again to be a powerful expression of God and to remember that as an, ex an expression of God, your job and your role is to realize that when you're talking and dealing with people, that you're an expression of eternity to somebody. And that's what it means to be an enthusiastic fan, where you're bold in your declaration of what Jesus Christ has done for you, so that you can be a crazy fan. Secondly, crazy fans are loyal. They don't just switch teams. In Galatians chapter 6, let us not lose heart in doing good, for in due time we will reap if we do not grow weary. So then, while we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. Let us, know, let us not grow weary in doing good. Listen, every time we play the spring box, I have hope we're going to win. I'm a loyal fan. Do we win every time we play there? No, we don't. But I'm loyal to my to my team, because I believe in them. I'm a supporter of the booker. And I'm bold in my support of them. But when they lose, I don't switch teams. Because the All Blacks are better than us, most of the time. But I don't switch teams. And there's a booker jersey there in church this morning. I love it. But you can't get a crazy fan to switch teams. You know what a loyal fan drives a couple of hours in their car, they spend 500 bucks on petrol, 300 bucks to pay for parking two k's away from the stadium, 70 rand for a ticket, and another 100 rand on a horrible hot dog to support their team. Crazy fans do crazy things to support their team. You know, when it comes to our relationship with God, we complain because the parking lot is full. Hello? Don't put a downer on it, Steve. <laughs> you know, a, a loyal fan is somebody who will do whatever it takes to support their team. And, man, every fan believes that they can do things better. They, they think they're better than the coach. They think that they are better than the ref. Don't they? Which leads me to my next point. A fan is a student. Of Man, a fan knows the stats. They know where we are on the log. They play fantasy rugby. They, they know who's in the side, who isn't in the side. They know or try and figure out what the team play is. They're constantly studying what is the game. They know when the rules have changed. And as a crazy fan, our responsibility is to continually study the playbook, which means the Bible, okay? We need to be spending time in the playbook to discover who we're supporting. We need to be discovering, you know, we all know, okay, let me not say we all know. For those of you who are Springbok fans, most of us know who Warren Whiteley is. Okay, if you don't know who he is, he's the new Springbok captain. And we all say, no, we know Warren Whiteley, because we went and we, we got his autograph at Plettenberg Bay when they were practicing rugby there. And we all say we know him. But you know who really knows him? His mom knows him. And his wife knows him even more. Why? Because there is an intimate acquaintance and relationship with him. And that is why we spend time in the Word. We spend time studying the playbook so that we can get to know God, so that we can become His fan. In 2 Peter 1.3, 
according as his divine power has given unto us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue. He's given us an expression of himself in his word so that we can find out who he is. In 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now notice what he's saying here in this portion in, in Timothy. He's not saying study so that God can approve of you. Notice it doesn't say that. What does it say? Study to show who? Thyself. It doesn't say study to show God. It says study to show yourself that you're approved. That you might rightly divide the word of truth without shame in your heart. See, and that's the whole love letter in God's word to you and I is God trying to show you that he has approved of you. That he's not against you. That he is for you, that he loves you, that he approves of you, that he has, he's accepted you for who you are, not who you think you should be. And that is why I study the word, to show myself, listen, God approves of me. I need not have any shame in my walk with God because Jesus dealt with my shame. And that is how I could rightly divide the word of truth. See, when we have a, a mindset that is steeped in legalism, Every time we read the word, all we see is a to-do list. And there are many to-dos in, in, in the word of God, but the to-dos come out of relationship with the, my, the one who I'm loving and worshiping because I know that it's for my benefit and the commandments of God are not burdensome. But that only comes because of intimacy and relationship with God. Not because I think in my head that he's putting ticks and crosses next to my name, whether I'm doing it right or wrong. No, the word of God is about life and death, not right and wrong. So study to show yourself, man, listen, I am a powerful expression of God. Say that after me. Say, I am a powerful expression of God. That was a bit weak. Let's say it again. <laughs> say after me, I'm a powerful expression of God. You see, when God lives inside of you, that is who you are. God chose you to express himself to others. The fourth thing about a crazy fan is they are promotional. They are not ashamed. They're not ashamed about their choices. It's like my wife, my team. Oh, I'm going to miss my wife. They are bold in their declaration of who they're supporting. They're bold about their team. They're bold in saying, listen, they all sing the song, he call me Boca. They won't clap their hands in church. But geez, when the Springboks score a try, there's no honest worry, are you? In Acts 1.8, it says, When the Holy Spirit comes on you, you will be able to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, all over Judea and Samaria, even to the ends of the world. When the Holy Spirit lives inside of you, he's saying, listen, he will give you a boldness to proclaim who I am. In Acts 4.31, it says, And when they prayed, the place in which they were assembled was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they continued to speak the word of God with freedom and boldness and courage. Verse 33, and with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and great grace was upon them all. As a believer, God has said in his word that if you have the Holy Spirit in you, you are going to be a bold witness of me. Why is it when it comes to supporting our football, football team or rugby team, man, we are bold and courageous in, in declaring this is who I'm a fan of, but in our relationship with God, we hold back. Question mark. Number five, a crazy fan is generational. Listen, my children do not have a choice in which team they're going to support. <laughs> they have been trained from young that they will support the Springboks. There's no choice there. It's the same in, with regards to church. My children don't have a choice as to whether they're going to come to church or not. And that's not because I the pastor of this church. It's something that even when I wasn't pastoring, that was a decision that I'd made in my heart. My children do not have a choice, but you know what? They love church so much, they want to come. But I don't wake up in the morning, ask them, do you feel like coming to church this morning? 
No. When we wake up in the morning, they know. Sunday, they go to church. See, my children don't get a vote whether they're going to be a fan or not. Are they fans? Yes, they're fans. But they didn't get a vote. <laughs> you know, real God fans understand it's their job to make sure that their young children are plugged into church. And I know I'm preaching to the converted here, okay, because you're here. But you know, church isn't a, isn't a choice just like school isn't a, church, a, a choice. It's like you've got to go to school. There's no choice there. And it's the same thing with church. It's like you're going to church. It's my net, who did us? You don't vote. You don't get a choice. I made the choice for you. And I know that when, one day when my kids are teenagers, they're going to be fabulous teenagers. I believe it with all my heart. Because we teach them now as youngsters the power of choice. That's how we teach and train our children. When they were very young, we, we, we explained to them the power of choice and that a bad choice leads to a bad consequence, which was Mr. Smacks. But the older they've got, the more freedom we give them, yet we still remind them of the power of choice. So it hasn't been forced down their throat to manipulate them because we're a sergeant major and a sergeant majoress in our house. No, it's because we have trained them in the power of choice. That when you make good choices... There is good reward. When you make bad choices, there is a bad consequence. Because one day, I'm not going to be in their presence in the amongst, amongst their peers. And they're going to have many opportunities to make bad choices. And I'm not going to be there to control them. So what, have we, what do we train them in? We train them in the power of choice. And we've trained them from young. Listen, if you continue to make bad choices, you're going to get Mr. Smacks. So now that they're a little bit older, they recognize, listen, the, my choices have consequences. Hello? That's why I'm saying, when my kids are teenagers, I believe with all my heart they're not going to be perfect. Whose children are perfect? Our cho oh, some hands went up. <laughs> Crazy fans are generational. If you're a parent, make sure your kids are plugged into church. In Psalm 127, 3 and 4, it says, Lo, children are a heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. As arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. Number six, a crazy fan is not a fair weather fan. They support their team no matter what. You know, average attendance, church attendance in South Africa is one out of four Sundays. That's average church attendance. Attendance. So if you think about it, that's 12 times a year who people say are committed to church. If you ask them, what church you go to? Meisner Vineyard. Because they've attended once a month. Now, I'm, I know I'm talking to the converted because you're here. But you know, you'll never grow in your relationship with God, in relationship with people, if you hear one out of four Sundays. It's just your, your growth will be stagnated because you're not growing and developing relationships. You're not growing in terms of your knowledge of who God is. Imagine if your kids only attended one out of four days in school. Where would they be with regards to their capacity as students? Hello? It's very quiet. Hebrews 10. 24 to 25, let's see how inventive we can be in encouraging love and helping out. Not avoiding worshiping together as some do, but spurring each other on, especially as we see the big day approaching. Listen, if you want to get the most out of church, show up at least three out of four Sundays, give at least 10% of your income, and serve. It's very simple. When you start serving, when you start giving, when you start being a part of the life of the church, all of a sudden, you get a lot out of church. And we'll leave it there. Number seven. Can you believe? Seven points, eh? I normally only do three. Crazy fans are invitational. So many times people said, come and see Jesus. Come and see. You know, I read some stats 
in a, on a church pastor's thing. They said 70% of people who are invited to church would come. 70%. This was a survey they did. 70% of unchurched people said that they would visit a church if a friend invited them. That's a very high percentage. And a lot of your friends have a bad mindset when it comes to church, and rightly so, because they've been told to come to church and you're going to get hammered. And you're going to feel worse. Some people, it's like, I don't want to invite somebody to church because I don't want them to feel as bad as I do. I don't want them to feel like I do, so I'm not going to invite them to church. But thank God that this church isn't like that. But you know, simply by inviting someone, you can cause them to become a fan. Because they're going to encounter Jesus. In John 1, verse 45 and 46, it says, Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said to him, Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. In Matthew 28, it says, And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And, lo, I am with you always, even until the end of it. You know, the Great Commission is not not a great suggestion. It's the Great Commission. It's a commandment that was given by Jesus. Go and tell others of me. Go and share with them. Share what... I have done in your life. Go and tell people. God in his wisdom has entrusted you and I with the gospel. Now, in my natural thinking, I'm like, Lord, that wasn't very wise. You're entrusting me. You're entrusting us to be a witness and to be a proclamation of the gospel. Lord, it would be better if you did it yourself. Yet God chose you in his wisdom And he's asked you to be the bold declaration of his goodness. That's how wise he is. That he has chosen you to go and declare who he is. That's amazing. You know, all you got to do for many times if you are not bold enough is to just invite them to church. Because I do an altar call at the end of every service where people can encounter him. But you've got to invite them. You know, Bailey is an American. But he's become a Springbok fan because of one invite by Yanu. (laughs) Yanu invited him to a Springbok rugby practice in Plettenberg Bay. And Bailey went and he was like, I don't know anything about rugby. And then he went and saw how Khuradi Mana is. And he was like, I'm going to learn rugby. That he's playing touch rugby now on Mondays and Thursdays. And he went and bought himself a Springbok jersey. He's become a fan because of one invite. And you can invite a friend and they can become a fan of Jesus. Say amen. Amen. These are I just put some things down here that a fan will you'll never hear a fan saying. The stadium and the crowd is too big. It's like we preferred it when the stadium was only five thousand people. No, listen. When you've got 100,000 Springbok fans, it's much better than when there were just 5,000. Hello? It's okay for church to grow and for church to be big. Okay? You know that in a small church and in a big church, you're, all, you're still only going to know between 35 and 50 people. You know that? So as church, don't be afraid if church grows and gets bigger. Heaven is a big place. Lots of people there, and it's loud. In Acts 2, it says, And with many words he solemnly testified and kept on exerting, exhorting them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. So then those who had received the word were baptized, and that day there were added about 3,000. Church grew by 3,000 in one day. And they were just 120. It's like, no, no, we must just be our little 120. That's where it's safe. And it's like, well, then God added 3,000. It's like that mess with a whole bunch of people with regards to their thinking about church. Secondly, you won't hear a fan saying, it's too loud, so I'm not going back. Hello? In Psalm 147, verse 1, it says, Oh, clap your hands, all ye people. Shout unto God with a voice of triumph. That's why you see the worship team constantly saying, Hey, guys, you can clap hands. It's an instruction in, 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 in the Word where it says, Listen, you can clap hands. 
Shout. Shout with a voice of triumph. In Revelations 5, it says, I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne, and every living being and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000, and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. They were declaring with a loud voice, with many, many thousands of people. Number three, you'll never hear a fan saying the game has become too much like entertainment. Entertain means to capture and hold one's attention for an extended period of time. Jesus held people's attention to the degree that they would leave everything and follow him into the desert. In Mark 4, it says, With many stories like these, he presented his message to them, fitting the stories to their experience and maturity. He was never without a story when he spoke. And my last point is, a crazy fan will never say, Oh, it's all about money, so I'm not going back. Fans pay to go. They pay to to park, they pay to go into the stadium, they pay to buy food, they pay to spend night, a night in a hotel, and they come back, and what's happened? They've just watched a sports team. Wherever, Luke 12, 34, wherever your treasure is, there your heart and thoughts will also be. We've got to understand that the gospel needs finances. When you give financially, I see it as spiritual warfare because when you're giving financially, you're helping the gospel be extended. It takes money for the gospel to be proclaimed. The gospel is free, but it costs to proclaim it. And I'm never going to be ashamed of when I talk about money because many people want to silence We say, no, we don't talk about money in church. We talk about money in church. And it takes money to proclaim the gospel so that we can reach people. And my heart behind it is I know that eternity is connected to it. Because when somebody gives their life to Jesus, it's because of your giving. Those prisoners who received Christ yesterday, they received Christ because we as a church took up an offering. We bought them gifts. We took our time. We went to the prison and we proclaimed the gospel, but it took money to do that. What opened up their hearts was us coming there with no reward from them. There was nothing that we were going to get out of it. We went there to be a blessing to them. Do they deserve it? No, they don't. Do we deserve the gospel? No, we don't. But God, who is rich in mercy, saved us. So we went and we were merciful to those who were not deserving of it, but what opened their hearts when we went and we had fun with them and we gave them gifts. Man, it, you know, looking through the cell there because the way that we handed out those bags was, you know, we, you've got to realize that you're in prison there. So you can't just give bags because then the guy will say, no, I never got one. Meanwhile, he's got two behind his back. This must be in the gefangenis, eh? So the way we did it, thank God for Freddie because, and, and Marcel, is you get your bag and then you go into the cell. So they can't come out and say they never got one. But to see them on their beds, looking inside that packet and emptying it out and taking each thing and looking at it and stuffing their faces with two chocolates and the joy and the excitement that they had by receiving something. But you know, it took your money to do that. But the rewards are eternal. Because one day you're going to get to heaven and you're going to have some guy coming and saying, listen, you don't know me, but I was in prison and you came and visited me. Because you were a participant in sowing into somebody's life that you don't even know. Yet eternity will reward you for it. And that is why, listen, your finances and your giving are important. And there is an eternity connected to it. So we won't be ashamed of, of letting people know that. But it takes money to reach people. My last point this morning. Your greatest fan is your heavenly father. And he believes in you. 
and he's your best fan who is spurring you on, who's saying, listen, I don't leave you nor forsake you. Even when you make bad choices and you don't get it right, I'm never going to desert you because I believe in you. In 1 John 4, 19, it says, In this act we see what real love is. It is not our love for God, but His love for us when He sent His Son to satisfy God's anger against our sins. See, when I know that God is my greatest fan, when I know that God believes in me, when nobody else believes in me, God believes in me, that His love never fails, that He will keep on believing in me. No matter what I do or don't do, He's my greatest fan. He's the one who keeps on saying, listen, I'm for you. There is nothing that can come against you because I'm in you. I'm with you. I'm never going to leave your hand. I'm never going to forsake you. I'm never going to desert you. I'm always going to be for you. And when I know that God is my greatest fan, I then, when I choose to believe that, I become his greatest fan. Because I, I can't help but love somebody who believes in me like this. Why don't you stand to your feet this morning? Maybe you're standing here this morning, and it's like, man, you know what? I've been withdrawn, or I have taken a, a step back in my pre- proclamation and declaration of Jesus. I've been afraid of people. I've been afraid about what they might think, what my family might say, or my friends might say, if I have to tell them about God, if I have to tell them about Jesus. And you've been in the shadows with regards to your faith. My challenge to you this morning is that you have an opportunity right now to make a decision in your heart to say, you know what, Lord, I'm going to become your your greatest proclaimer. I'm going to be your greatest fan in my declaration of your goodness and your love and what you've accomplished for me. And I'm going to be bold. I'm going to be a witness. I'm not going to be standing in the shadows and that my friends and family hear about you, I'm going to be bold in declaring your goodness. And my challenge this morning is, are you up for it? Are you willing to be an expression of God through word and deed by proclaiming and doing the gospel? Why don't you close your eyes, bow your feet. I'm going to ask you this morning, There's two challenges that I'm going to be putting out this morning. The first is for you as a believer. If you know that you haven't been as bold as you should have been, if you know in your heart that you've been behind the scenes and you just sense that God is challenging you this morning to say, you know what, I'm going to be a bold proclaimer of the gospel. If that's you this morning, why don't you just slip up your hand and say, yes, that's me. I've I've been with withdrawn in my proclamation because I've been afraid of what people might say. Just slip up your hand. Okay, you can put your hand down. Because it's about what God sees. And God's encouragement to you is, don't worry about what you need to say, but if you trust me, I will give you the words that you need. At the right time, in the right situation, I will give you the words, but take the opportunity. The Bible says, redeem the time because the days are evil. Take the opportunities. Ask God to create opportunities, but then you've got to be bold in your declaration of Him. And that's what I believe God wants to tell you this morning. Those of you who put up your hands, God's encouragement is when you take that step to say, Lord, use me. There are going to be opportunities and situations and divine appointments where God is going to give you where you can proclaim of his, pro- proclaim His goodness. So all I'm asking you this morning is say, yes, Lord. Say, yes, Lord. Give me those opportunities. I will be bold. I'll take that opportunity to be a bold witness to my friends and family. Even to strangers, Lord. Bring them across my path. I will share the gospel. And then secondly, maybe you've come here this morning, you're not a fan of Jesus. You have never encountered him. You've never given your life to him. You've never surrendered to his lordship. You've never ever said, Lord, be be my boss. Be the one that I follow. I want to follow you. I didn't realize that you were good and kind and loving and that you accept me for who I am. But today's a day when I respond to you. 
The Bible says that he stands at the door and he knocks, but you're the one who has to open it. The Bible says that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father except through Jesus. Jesus is the only mediator between God and man. No one else can, can give you eternal life. Only Jesus can. And his instruction is, we must be born again. We've got to receive the Spirit of God, where he takes out a heart of stone and he gives us a heart of flesh. And that comes by receiving Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. So I want to pray for you. If you're standing here this morning, you know you've never been born again. You've never received Jesus. But this morning you're saying, I want to receive the gift of eternal life. I want to receive the gift of Jesus. I would love to pray with you. So if that is you this morning, and you want me to lead you in that prayer, to where you're saying, Lord, I want to receive you as my Lord and Savior. Why don't you just slip up your hand so I can see who you are, and I'm going to lead you in a simple prayer to receive Jesus. Just slip up your hand so I can see you. Thank you, man. Thank you. Thank you. Right, I'm going to ask all of us as a family to pray with those who put up their hands and those who wanted to put up their hands. If you wouldn't mind just praying after me, just say, Heavenly Father, thank you that you love me. I believe in you, Jesus. I believe you died for me. I believe you rose again. And I believe you are Lord of all. Save me. Thank you that I'm forgiven. Thank you that I'm loved by you. Thank you that you know me. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you for your love, Lord. We thank you, Father, for eternity, that we are connected to eternity because we're in your kingdom, Lord. We pray for those who lifted up their hands, who said, yes, Lord, I'm going to be a bold witness, Lord. We pray for those who said, yes, I'm going to become a fan of Jesus by surrendering my life to him. We thank you, Father, that all of heaven rejoices. We thank you, Father, for those prisoners who gave their life to you yesterday, who said, yes, Lord Jesus, we want you. We thank you, Lord, that all of heaven rejoices for them, for lives that have been changed. We thank you for your love. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You are highly favored and deeply loved of God. Be a bold witness for Jesus this week.